the three mental hurdles to recovering from gaming addiction. Hi, my name is Luke Boo, PhD, clinical psychologist, mental health expert, helping young men overcome digital addiction, depression, and anxiety. There are essentially three mental hurdles stopping you from recovering from gaming addiction and three tools to help you overcome them. Quick disclaimer, I'm not your psych, this isn't treatment, and if you need a psychologist, you should find a registered, qualified psych in your area. The first mental hurdle, change is so hard, why should I change? It's far easier to stick to what you're currently doing than change, that much is obvious. We cling to the familiar, we double down on the time we invest into our life activities. Gaming addiction is the extreme end of this concept. My slash played for the game right now, 1,149 days. So multiply that by 24, and that's how long I played one character. From a psychological perspective, part of addiction is when you're doing something repeatedly that causes problems in the long term. It's important to truly understand and appreciate that whatever you're addicted to, gaming, pornography, gambling, can be genuinely exciting, fun, enjoyable, and often meaningful to you. Gaming meets your short-term needs, but it probably has impaired the achievement of your longer-term goals such as finishing your degree, social relationships, and career progression. And this trade-off is at the center of addiction. The most common mistake here is to truly not get in touch with all the benefits of gaming. It's difficult to change something that we don't fully understand. For long-lasting change and to truly quit something, you can't be tricked into it. Rather, you got to make a deliberate decision that the cons outweigh the pros. Tool number one, the pros and cons list. Pull out a sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle, and make a pros and cons column. Now be honest with yourself and write down all the benefits of gaming, every single benefit. Now some examples include, I take pride in my skills, stress relief from conflict, it's fun, I'm entitled to it, I get a sense of achievement, it's part of my identity, and so on. Look at the pros column and ask yourself, given all these positive reasons, why in the world would I ever stop? Now, chances are you feel resistance to that question. So let's look at the cons column. I want you to write down and identify the costs of gaming to you, every single one. An example could be, I'll never get a career. I failed my studies. My wife is always upset with me. I don't play with my children. Going back to the trade-off we mentioned earlier, I want you to examine both sides closely and acknowledge that if you give up the pros, you also get less of the cons. But always be fair to yourself. Understand that when you first made the decision to game, there probably weren't that many disadvantages advantages and you probably didn't have that many responsibilities. Now the situation has changed, as life does, and there are probably more cons than there are pros. Allow yourself to understand that you made rational and reasonable decisions in the past, given the pros and cons. Now here comes the heavy moment of truth. Are you willing to sacrifice the pros that you've identified? If that answer is yes, we continue to the second hurdle. Feeling bad sucks. Why should I feel negative emotion? It's easier to develop habits that tap into social and pleasure, information and caloric needs. And gaming meets three of the four needs mentioned. For those who aren't gamers, gaming is intensely enjoyable. That's the point of it. Repeatedly playing games makes it more rewarding in a variety of ways. Most of those who game will go through phases of problematic and unproblematic patterns of gaming. The deciding ingredient is when we use this habit to manage negative emotions. Now, the negative emotions could be from the game itself, such as withdrawal, effects that appear like anger, or boredom, but it could also be from outside factors such as work, relationships, or academic stressors. A common example I use is the difference between having ice cream after dinner as a treat versus an ice cream binge to cope with a bad day. Clearly, if you get into the habit of gaming to deal with negative emotions, you're going to create a new problem because life is full of negative emotions. What's worse is that excessive gaming tends to create more conditions in which you're likely to experience these negative emotions in the first place. It's also worth noting that your negative emotions can can be a result of depression and anxiety issues as well. So for example, if you have a gaming problem, it's likely that your studies or your career isn't going that well, and this will lead to more negative emotions and the cycle continues. You're going to have to work out a way to manage negative emotions, period. The second tool, or tool number two, acceptance. You will have to fully experience these negative emotions. You're going to have to learn to tolerate them, accept them and ultimately create a solution that doesn't lead to more negative emotion. You'll have to practice acceptance. Logging into your game won't solve your problem. Accepting the negative emotion and learning to work with it is more likely to lead to a better outcome. I can only encourage you to take the better deal for the long term, but no one can make you. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo, but I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. If you're still with me here, we've reached the third mental hurdle. 
I don't want to think about the future. What should I sacrifice my gaming for? So this is a little trickier. The third hurdle, and for a lot of my clients, they haven't even envisioned life after overcoming the gaming problem. For a good portion of them, abstaining from gaming might mean an extra 30 or 40 hours a week to reinvest into other things. I can tell you that a significant portion of my patients were afraid or anxious attempting to figure out their lives and build a vision of their future self. In all honesty, it's simply confronting to think about your future goals precisely. It's overwhelming to see how much work is ahead of us and the investment required to get to where we want to be. I don't blame you if you want to keep gaming if it means delaying the decision. But if you're ready to articulate your future, this is the tool for you. Tool number three, forecasting. On a piece of paper, I want you to write down where you want to be in three years if you took control of your gaming. What are you doing? Who are you with? Who are you? Imagine it fully in as much detail as you can. Allow yourself to daydream and fantasize what this life could be. Imagine that you can get closer to that dream if you're able to make decisions in the moment that support your future self. This might mean sleeping at regular times, turning up to lectures. In addition, it's also useful to write down where you would be in three years if you lost control of your gaming. What are you doing? Who are you with? Who are you? Imagine it fully in as much detail as you can. Allow yourself to daydream and to fantasize what this life might look like. Understand that things can get worse without action. Sometimes habits and addictions get out of control because we fall out of the practice of thinking about our future selves. Personally, I think there's an unspoken nobility in sacrifice intensely pleasurable and comfortable things for often delayed rewards that aren't immediately gratifying. Sacrificing gaming often means having to deal with the negative emotions we have been avoiding and the problems we've been neglecting. Take heart, take little steps forward towards a life without gaming addiction. It's probably more than worth it. I really hope you found this useful. Don't forget to hit subscribe. I'm Luthu, be kind, be you. Catch you next time.